Good evening. My name is Evan Plesla Adams, and I'm so happy to uh, present some ideas to you tonight around the, the very simple concept of two-eyed seeing, which uh, most of us are, are lucky enough to have. Um, these two masks were uh, collected here in the north of British Columbia. One is in the Louvre in Paris, and uh, one is at the Canadian Museum of Civilization in Gatineau. Uh, and one is blind and one is sighted, and it might represent uh, maybe us looking at you or looking forward and back. Now, this is a fish. It's called a sole. You've probably eaten it. It's a very humble fish. Uh, it can look in two directions at once. It's a, it's a bit unlike um, human beings who have binocular vision, but they usually look, those eyes look in the same direction, from, but from slightly different positions. So is two-eyed seeing or looking forward and looking back uh, whimsical? Is it avant-garde? Is it post-colonial? Maybe it's part of being the pluralistic multicultural success story of being in modern Canada. Maybe this is reconciliation. And maybe two-eyed seeing is the ability to look inward and outward at once. Uh, maybe we can self-reflect. Uh, maybe we must look ourselves in the eye, see the truth, and be able to sleep at night. And maybe two-eyed seeing is hopeful or beautiful, or it's the idea of balance, the idea of getting back to optimism and to beauty. Maybe two-eyed seeing is about love and family and togetherness, um, strength, acceptance. Maybe it's about prosperity of both um, or of all. Now, two-eyed seeing is a concept um, that exists um, in indigenous culture. Um, and there is a, a very famous academic, uh, Mr. Albert uh, Marshall, who talks about two-eyed seeing as learning to see with the strengths of each other and together, looking one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and with the other eye, the strengths of Western knowledges and ways of knowing, and that together we can look forward. So here's another way of seeing, 1492, two eyes coming together, Christopher Columbus uh, arriving in the, off an island in the Caribbean. He was lost looking for India. Uh, and uh, that arrival set off a great time or period of exploration for Europeans. This is a painting uh, of uh, Captain Cook when he was killed by Native Hawaiians um, on the big island of Hawaii in 1779. And aboard that ship was a midshipman named George Vancouver. George Vancouver came to the coast of British Columbia again and again and again. Uh, here's his, his, um, a, a portrait drawn when he came to my mother's village in 1792, uh, Cortez Island. Of course, my mother hadn't been born yet. <laughs> she was born about uh, a kilometer from here. And so f for me, uh, Captain Vancouver um, is very real. And we have very many stories about those. This is my great-grandfather, Ah Tum, Charlie Adams, who was born in 1860. This picture was taken of him in 1930 when he entered hospital with dementia. Uh, and uh, he's alive. He's blind, so he doesn't, he doesn't, he didn't, I hear, open his eyes um, as he walked about. And uh, he uh, lost his vision to smallpox. This is Canada. This is Canada. 1867. It looks different from our image of Canada today. I know when you imagine Canada in your minds, it's not this picture. Uh, and of course, I'll point out the two solitudes of English Canada and French Canada. Uh, we were there too. Um, but can you imagine Canada with indigenous roots? Well, part of its indigenous roots were um, the Indian Act, a federal act um, born in 1876, 140 years ago, uh, that uh, took great um, measures in controlling the lives of indigenous people. These are my parents. I'm sitting in my dad's lap. And uh, one of my sisters died when I was about five years old. She was accidentally shot to death by the boy next door. And I tell that story uh, because I knew even then, even as a five-year-old, that communities and people were meant to be organized to help each other, that that wasn't supposed to happen. And my family, who was quite wounded by that, um, deserved help, and we should be organized enough to help. So the challenge for us today in Canada is that health outcomes between First Nations and other Canadians is different. It, it's unacceptable, it's unethical, and it's sustain, unsustainable. And so uh, what shall we do? Just to point out, Dr. Kamara Jones in Undoing Racism describes in A Gardener's Tale that a gardener notices that pink flowers grow taller than red flowers, and she thinks pink flowers are better. 
forgetting that she's planted them in different parts of the garden, one in rich soil and one in poor soil. And so we discussed the, the idea of the social determinants of indigenous health, that the quality of health, the quality of life, the length of life, the lack of suffering is tied to poverty, to education, and to housing, of course, for all of us. But for indigenous people, it's also related to culture and to self-determination, that the lack of determination can change one's health. Here are two um, Aboriginal medical students who graduated just a, a few weeks ago uh, in my teaching at UBC. Um, we discovered that 31 out of 32 Aboriginal medical students had racist experiences that were strong enough to discourage them from continuing, and we had to talk to them about staying in their programs. And thus the idea comes forward, if we're going to face uh, the inevitability of a racist experience, perhaps we should be armed for racist experiences. And that doesn't mean that all of you or all of us are racist, simply that the reaction, the idea of resistance and resilience is one that we must live with. When I moved to BC with my new medical degree and I went to St. Paul's Hospital, I went into the doctor's lounge. I was very proud. I looked exactly like this. Uh, within five minutes, the security guard came up to me and he said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, one of the doctors has reported that there's an Indian in the doctor's lounge. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, yeah, you better get used to it. Part of my work is to work with Aboriginal populations. One day we had a chief who was fighting for the return of an infant who had died. The chief coroner said, by law I'm allowed to keep this infant body uh, for as long as I see fit and I can remove parts of that body and keep them in order to determine a cause of death. And the chief slammed his fist on the ground or on the table and said, we know you think you're in charge, but we think that's our baby. So, to get where we need to go, we may need to fly in a different way. I showed this to an elder, and she said, oh yeah, the male eagle flies up down when it is having sex. And I said, oh, that's <laughs> not quite what I wanted to say. And she said, yeah, that's a sexy eagle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>